He's that good. It's preaching time. Acts chapter number two. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. The word fellowship means more than being together. It means having in common. It means sharing together. You go to your workplace there's a lot of people that are together in one place, but it doesn't mean that they have fellowship. You may have thousands of people that come to the workplace, but not everybody is in fellowship. Fellowship is having things in common. When you have fellowship with close friends or family, what makes that fellowship so urgent is what you share. The things that you share together, the common bonds makes fellowship happen. You have a secret. You share your secret with those that are close to you. That's fellowship. People in fellowship with you know things about you that other people don't know about. Fellowship. Sharing. Caring. And learning together. And they had all things in common. You know, when you live together in one household, your parents tell you to share what? Everything. Who drank my Kool-Aid? <laughs> Mom, that, that was mine. I bought that with my own money. <laughs> That's different than buying with mom and dad's money. That was mine. But fellowship means all things in common. You're wearing that. That's mine. You're wearing my. That's mine. Well, that's right. We have all things in common. You know what difficult it is when you even see somebody wearing the same thing that you have on. Like, how dare you wear the same thing that I'm wearing? <laughs> it looks better on you than it does on me. <laughs> Fellowship. All things in common. Even in scripture, as Paul was sharing this thing about having things in common, they took it a step too far. They started sharing wives and husbands. Yeah, that's taken too far, huh? Even Paul had to come down with the scripture, and I'm looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 2. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. It's the things that we share that determine our fellowship. If we want to be a church that fellowship together, we're going to share things that's in common. Not just our love for Jesus Christ, but our love for one another. You have to genuinely and sincerely care about someone else to have fellowship. Fellowship is not about me. It's about us. In the Lord's Prayer, it's a fellowship prayer. Communion. The scripture says, our Father, lead us not to temptation. Forgive us. Deliver us from evil. Forgive us our sins. It's not about me. It's about us. In prayer, we are to pray fellowship. Remembering those that are struggling. Not always, Lord, I need. Lord, what about me? But Lord, what about the ones that may not know you? Fellowship is about trying to find a way to seal that bond with them and find a way to bring them closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Fellowship is not so much what happens in here. The true fellowship for believers is what happens outside these walls. The fellowship that we have that allows others to see our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through you and through me. They may never come to the church. They may never read the scriptures. But to them, you are the church. You are the living, walking word of God. And if people are to learn who our Lord and Savior is, they will learn, first of all, through someone who knows him. It's good to know somebody who knows somebody, isn't it? That's what it's about. When you know somebody that knows somebody, that's it. That's all you need. I, I met Kim, and I didn't know Kim, but my office manager knew Kim. And I knew somebody who knew somebody. And the rest, as they say, uh -huh. <laughs> it's good when you know somebody who knows somebody. 
and we just have a God who just says, all I need you to do is just get him close enough to me. If you just bring him close enough to me, if you, if you catch him, I'll clean him. Because <laughs> the Bible says be fishes of men. Is that right? All we do is catch him. We just get him close enough to Jesus. He'll scale him. He'll scale him down. He'll, he'll clean him. And people will look at him again and wonder, is that the same person? Because once God has got hold of you, once he's really gotten a hold of you, you won't look the same, you won't walk the same, you won't talk the same. Nothing in your life will be the same. He says it this way, that anyone in Christ is a new creature. Old things are what? And all things have become what? New. How many need something new? Raise your hand if you need something new in your life right now. I'm going to raise both hands. They, and a foot. New. God promises all things new. The old things, but the old things have to pass away. You see, you got you to gotta let some old things go in order to have something new. Right, Janet? You got to let old things go. It's hard to let old things go because they might come back in style. We hold on to some old stuff. I never went home, I'd find some old stuff in your closet. I'd find some old stuff. Huh? Just holding on. 1974 leisure suit. Old stuff, huh? Big wide bell bottom jeans. Old stuff. Larry, what you gonna do with these? Oh no, no, Pastor, don't look at that. that was, huh? Old stuff must pass away so that all things can become new. I believe that new is trying to come. I believe that new is trying to come to you right now. But new is trying to find a place. And new can't really come until there's space made by getting rid of the old. It's difficult, isn't it? Old is familiar. You can trust old. Hmm? Old never disappoints. But there's something about the opportunity to have something new. That new car smell, right? Old car just can't match a new car smell. You can get new car fragrance, it's just not the same. You might know what new car smells like, right? They last for about three months. They last about three months till the payments start. <laughs> the advantages of fellowship is in Ecclesiastes chapter number four and verse number 12. Write and make a note. Ecclesiastes four and 12 says a three chord strand is not easily broken. So that means you need to have more than you. You can't keep warm by yourself, but the more people that come together, the more warmth, the more unity is added to one another. In Matthew chapter number 18, in verse number 18, Matthew 18 and 18 says that if two or more of you agree on anything on earth, it will be done by my Father, which is in heaven. So again, in fellowship, we agree. We agree. When Kim and I met Ron at ICU this week, we agreed that God was going to bring him back and heal him and make him better than ever. And I was thinking today as I was coming in, I'm going to have to visit Ron in hospital today. And then Ron walks in here. Huh? Isn't that God? That was God. I was going to, I was going to visit you today. So you messed up my Sunday. <laughs> so Jesus is looking for fellowship. So wherever two or more are coming together, common mind, one purpose, one heart, he's there in the midst. We talked before about synergy. Synergy means that the whole is greater than the sum. That means if you can do 20 units of work and I can do 20 units of work, the sum is 40 units of work. But the reality, if both of us come together and work together, we'll do more than 40. We'll do 80, maybe 100 or more. That's synergy. See, more can be accomplished when people come together. Team, T-E-A-M, means together everyone achieves more. That's what a team is. Together Everyone achieves more. And we can learn a lesson from the geese. The geese fly in a V formation because they find that as they fly that way, each one creates an updraft for the one behind it. And as this updraft is created in that V formation, they're able to fly 72% further than if they flew by themselves. You see, you can go further in a group than you can ever go by yourself. You need fellowship. It's not optional. You need fellowship. Number one says fellowship provides an opportunity for spiritual growth. Uh, Titus chapter number two, verse number three and four says the older women 
Now, he, he instructs the men and women, but this, was, this particular scripture talks about the older women. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children. So he's telling the younger, listen to the older. Older, teach the younger. My mother had something called quilting bees a long time ago. And quilting bees was a social group where the community of women would come together and they would quilt together. And it was more than just creating a work of art and beauty. It was about fellowship. Because there they would lay their burdens down to one another. And they would learn and grow together. And if there was someone that was newly married, they would get together at quilting bee and they'd say, so how's it going with that boy? Well, it's doing okay, then you tell us about it. And they would work through problems in the quilting bee. And that was the community that was needed to help bring families together. We miss that opportunity now in our lives. We rarely ever come together. We go into our garage, we close the door. The only time we'd ever see our neighbor is when they're leaving their garage. That's not the way it was meant to be. Fellowship means community. We have our men's group. We have our women's group. Well, we're going to be forming our women's group again. I'll be having relationship classes coming soon. And with that, you're going to grow spiritually in each one of those classes and groups. Especially in our men's group, we teach five things that men need to know and you need to talk about every week in your home. At least five things you need to talk about every week if your relationship is going to grow. But you'll never know what those five things are unless you come to a a session or classes and learn those five things. But there are five things that you need to talk about every week if your relationship is going to grow. Now you say, okay, Pastor, what's those five things? <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you about those when we get to our classes. But I'm sharing with you that there are things you need to know that you can only learn in fellowship. And when you learn what you don't know, that's the advantage you have, learning what you don't know. It's the weakest link that breaks the chain. Is that right? The weakest link is the things that you don't know. You may have good intentions, but does not have the knowledge. Don't have the understanding. Good and well-meaning, but missing the weakness that you have that's not allowing you to grow. Paul directs and instructs the older men, older women, younger women, and younger men, selecting every category within the church and giving basic instructions to them. Teach and learn. I know that the younger people, sometimes they prefer not to listen to parents. Sometimes we were like, we were like that probably at one point, right? We didn't listen to our parents. Uh, and now sometimes our parents, and parents can be guilty of not wanting to confront, not wanting to create an uncomfortable burden for their children. So rather than giving them the reality, I'll just provide friendship for them. And friends are wonderful, but when they're growing and they have children of their own or they're mature adults, they need instruction. An instruction that you never gave them would be the shortcoming in their relationship with their family and with their spouses. Young women should be teachable, not argumentative, not angry, not defensive, not, not wanting to hear what someone has to say. You should be open and receptive because truth, like many things, comes in small packages. It's not big things that changes your life. It's sometimes the little bitty things, the small things that someone says to you that can be the navigating point that will change your life. Someone has spoken a small thing to you and you ignored it because it didn't sound or seem to be what you wanted to hear at the time. Don't neglect simple and small beginnings. <clears throat> Janet teaches a class, a spin class, and uh, every Saturday is a Janet. Every Saturday she teaches a spin class. And even before she was helped with the AV team, she was teaching, a, well, she was taking class Sunday mornings before church, a spin class before church Sunday mornings. Now, my weakness is I don't do spin classes. As much as I'd love to come to Janet's class, it ain't going to happen, Janet. <laughs> it's not happening. I can see it now. I'm up there and Janet, like, come on, Pastor. You know, 30 people there, and she's looking at me, and I'm. That wouldn't look good. Now I can lift weights all day long. I can go and do that. I can press and push. But when it comes to spinning, I don't spin. 
Real men don't spend, no. <laughs> but your weakness will come from the thing that you just don't do. There's certain things that you have that position about, right? I don't do this. I don't do that. I, you know, we can, I don't, you know how you can do it, right? But that one thing that you just choose not to do is sometimes be a weakness. Because it's, you need to be well-rounded. You can't just choose to isolate yourself with certain things and not others. Grow in areas where you're weak. Don't just keep strengthening your strengths. I like doing these things, so I'll do more of the things that I like. You have to especially learn how to do some things that you don't like if you want to grow. Growth is about doing some things that's just unpleasurable at times. You got to do it anyway. Don't have to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Kim is on the treadmill an hour in the mornings. We're in our gym. I have, I'm doing the weights and Kim, and the bicycle is right next to Kim just saying, come on, Jean. <laughs> Be great to have fellowship with Kim. She's on the treadmill. I'm on the bike and we can talk. Not going to happen because real men don't spin. Okay. Number two. <laughs> Number two. I know he's being silly. I got a joke for you. Can I just give you, get a joke? Got a joke. Okay. <laughs> Kim, here it goes. <laughs> A wife goes to the, the pharmacist. I like not, not some cyanide for my cheating husband, my lying, cheating husband. He says, ma'am, we can't, I can't sell you cyanide. She said, but you don't understand. He's a terrible person. You got to help me. He says, ma'am, I can't do it. He said, she said, but you got to help me out. Some. He said, I can't, ma'am. She said, look, I got pictures. He said, ma'am, I don't want to see the pictures. She said, but look. He looks and he sees the pictures of her husband with his wife. He says, I didn't know you had a prescription. Let me <laughs> Number two. <laughs> What's that? Fellowship is one of our basic needs. Fellowship is one of our basic needs. It's not optional. Hebrews chapter number 10, verse 24 and 25 Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. So let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Well, let's stop for a moment. That's what it should be about. When we come together, it's about love. It's all about love. And when we leave here, it's about good works. It's the works that we do that allows people to see our, our Father. Let your light shine before men that they may see your what? Good works. That they may glorify your Father which is in heaven. Love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting or lifting up, building up one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. It's not for me, Pastor. I'm just not a people person. I'm not one to get out there and blend. I'm more of a be a loner type. And I used to be that way. I used to be what was called an introvert. If I went into a room, I would sit back in the corner someplace and I would just not say anything because I didn't want anybody to criticize what I might say. And I thought if you just never said anything, never did anything, never went anywhere, no one could criticize you. But that's just not true. See, deep down, I had low self-esteem. Deep down, it was my own shortcoming. I did not believe in who I was. And if I didn't like myself, then it's easy for me to understand why other people would not like me. So rather than going out and being rejected, it's easier for me to just stay home. But the truth is we need fellowship. One of our basic needs is belonging. Once you satisfy your need for food and safety and shelter, the next basic need is to belong, to be part of something, to share, to have love, to have community. You may in your mind reason that you don't need it, but I'm telling you that your soul and your spirit cries out for unity. When a person is placed in solitary confinement, they're meant to isolate that person and put them in a deep, dark place. Isolating them from fellowship so that they're there and it's meant to break the spirit. 
And even though in, in, in prison situation it never does anything good, it tends to make a person more bitter and more angry and more isolated. And Satan's desire is for you to isolate yourself, <clears throat> to confine yourself away from others. And I find that people that are introverted find that they're on the very same thing to isolate themselves. They stay in closed places. And sometimes they'll be, even be dark. But God intends for us to come out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. When we get out there, we find that the light of Jesus Christ shines on us. And it's really not about us. It's really about him. When I go out and whenever I, whenever I do things, I realize it's not about me. It's about letting everyone see him and not me. Fellowship is not ministry, discipleship, or evangelism. Proverbs 27 and 17, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpen the countenance of his friend. We have our men's group. And one of one of the things about our men's group is the fellowship. And in our men's group, we feel we can talk about anything. We share scripture. We take the principles of God and we share it to daily living called life application. So a person off the streets can come into our men's group and they can feel just as at home because we're not so much going to scripture and Bible reading. We want to listen. We just want to understand. And fellowship is not about trying to bring a person closer to Jesus Christ. Fellowship is about just letting them see and feel the presence of God. It'll come later where they want to know about Jesus. And it's better for them to ask you about Jesus than you continually pressing Jesus on someone. When they see him, that's a, that's a sermon that's worth seeing. People love to hear a sermon, but it's something to see a sermon. To see love in action and faith in action and friendship and fellowship and peace and joy in action. We should be living, walking sermons. Don't talk about what pastor said or turn to the scripture. Let's, let's let them see Jesus in you. And when you go out there, as the Bible says, iron sharpens iron. You're just sharing and listening and enjoying the fellowship with others. We find out that's what community is really about. Fellowship is not about just assembling together. It's about sharing together. It's about loving one another. And letting others see the light of Jesus Christ in you. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for your word today on fellowship. Simple understanding.